Well, I'm going to begin by looking at the Muslim position and how the Muslims argue their case against us. Basically, the Muslim takes us back three and a half thousand to four thousand years ago, and they say that according to the Quran and the Christian Bible, when God first revealed himself to the people of Israel, he gave them the law, he gave them the Torah, he called them out as a special nation for himself, and not only that, but he created what you could call a theocratic state. There was to be the head, God himself as the head, and then the people were to uh, unite together as a people, as a nation, in the worship of God. And the Muslim Quran says that what happened after that is that the nation at times, and right up to the present day, people have turned away from God, they've brought changes in religion, they've brought they've infected religion with heresies, they brought all sorts of wrong things in, Christians especially, you know, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, things like that, deifying human beings and so on. And so they say that the, all the prophets came to call the people back to what was originally revealed. So that uh, David, through the Psalms, or the Zabur, the book that the Quran says was given to David, and then Jesus through the Injil, which was a book given to him, although nobody's ever seen any sign of it. And then the Quran given to Muhammad. And right throughout, even in the Quran, the Quran says it is only a hafez, that's an Arabic word meaning a guardian of what was already originally revealed. So the Muslim says, we come straight down the line of Moses from who he was. As Moses was a prophet of God, so Muhammad is also the final prophet of God. And they even take passages like Deuteronomy 18:18 18, 18 to try and justify that. But their argument, and to them it sounds very convincing, that the religion of God was originally a law-based religion. God gave his laws. The one supreme God told the people what to do, expected the people to conform to a pattern, to unite together. No real room for individuals or who individuals may be. The ultimate game, a goal, the ultimate aim is to get the people united in the worship of God and in a community that follows the law. So the Muslims say, that's what we're doing today, right this very day. And one of the best examples, or the worst examples of that, more likely, is what's called Islamic State. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of ISIS by now. Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. That's what ISIS stands for. And what's happened in the Middle East is that a number of Sunni Muslims have banded together under the leadership of a man called Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And they've made him what they call the Khalif, the new Khalif of Islam. The khalif is a, our word Khalif comes from the Arabic word Khalif, which means a successor. And from the time of Muhammad, right down to about 1923, they always had a Khalif, one supreme leader, not a ruler, but the sort of figurehead who symbolized the unity of Muslims worldwide in being united under the banner of Islam. Kemal Ataturk, the Turkish leader, after the First World War in 1923, decided that Turkey's future lay in Europe and not in the Muslim world. And he abolished the caliphate. And for centuries, the Ottoman Empire had sort of had control of it. And so from then till now, nearly 100 years, it hasn't existed. But Muslims have dreamt of the glory days again, when the Muslim world will be united together under one banner with one caliph and a single Islamic state that can perhaps, not necessarily a single state, but certainly a uniformity and a unity of Muslim nations bringing power to the Muslim world again. Well, Islamic states decided no more time waiting for that. They're just going to establish it without any reference to other Muslims, who, what they think, what they like. And they formed a body which has had incredible military success against the Syrians, against the Iraqis. At the moment, they're still fairly small, we don't know where it's all going to lead, but they control northern Iraq and eastern Syria. But they've created what they call the Caliphate. And if you listen to them, they say that what we are doing is to bring the purest Islam back into the world. And we're going to do whatever it takes to get the purest Islam reestablished. Uh, a utopia, heaven on earth, something like that. The kingdom of God on earth. 
Well, you only have to turn the internet on and just go, just go on a search engine to Islamic State Christians and call it up. And it'll come up as usual with images. You'll see four little photographs and it says images. Just push that button, more images, and it'll bring pages of the atrocities that Islamic State is committing. You cannot believe what they're doing. The butchery is bringing 1939 to 1945 back again. Uh, some of the cartoons I've seen have quite justifiably compared Islamic State to the Nazi rule of Germany. It's the same sort of thing. No compassion, nothing. Just killing people at will, killing Christians, butchering them, beheading them, and far worse. And doing so all in the name of introducing the purest Islam to the world. I have myself keep a little bit quiet on this because I'm well aware that the Muslims have got a point. If you try to say to them, our religion's not like this, you know, the religion of God is a religion of love and compassion, they point back very quickly and they say, going back to the beginning, this is exactly what your God told the Israelites to do when they walked into the land of Canaan and drove out the, didn't drive out the Jebusites, Hittites or the others, they were called to eliminate them, literally to massacre them, every single one of them, women and children. So I tend to keep myself a little bit quiet. But that was God telling his people to remove the people who were there, the idolaters that as far as God was concerned had become so godless that they needed to be removed. Otherwise, they would have been a thorn to the nation of Israel as indeed some of them became. What ISIS does is that it treats other Muslims as apostates, infidels and whatever. Anybody like Mubarak or um, uh, Colonel Gaddafi or Bashir Assad, any of these leaders in the Muslim world are regarded as apostates. They're not Muslims. They're just lackeys of the West or lackeys of somebody. They are just corrupt rulers, so they are apostates and infidels, and so they try and kill them as well. And in the Muslim world today, what is supposed to be the establishment of an ideal Muslim state is Muslims fighting Muslims everywhere. In, in Iraq, you've got the Shia uh, Muslims wanting to control Iraq because they control Baghdad. Then you've got the Sunni Muslims of various jihadist groups. They end up fighting each other. Islamic State ends up fighting other jihadist groups. Al-Qaeda and Islamic State eventually divided. There's no goodwill between them. The Islamic rebels of the Muslim rebels of Syria are fighting the Muslim government. Meanwhile, the Muslim Islamic State is fighting the rebels and the government. And I'm always reminded of the, uh, <clears throat> what the Bible says about Ishmael, his hand against every man and every man's hand against him. Now that, just to give you an introduction, is what happens when you try to create idealistic, purist states under the law, supposedly, of God in the world today. Ask yourself, I'm not going to answer you, but I'm sure you know the answer. What is the one little three-letter word that defines everything that's happening in the Muslim world today? You just think what it is. One word in the Bible, very common word, not a loved word, but very common. One thing that defines what was wrong with Israel, what's wrong with Islamic State, and what is wrong with everything. Well, I'm going to go back and say, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to the time when God instituted the theocratic state of Israel. And we have a look at it and let's see how far the Muslims might be true in saying that their religion is the same as the original one. Well, the original one began with these words. Moses said to God, Who are you? What is your name? That I might tell the people of Israel that they might know who you are. And God said, I am who I am. Simply meaning, I am God. I am Lord of all. And in the laws that he gave the people of Israel, the command consistently found in Leviticus everywhere was be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. In other words, be who I am. Be who I am. Right from the beginning, uh, when you look back to the, uh, even before the creation of Adam and Eve, you can see that God had a kingdom, God had a heavenly realm, and there, there were many angels and one supreme angel known to us generally as Lucifer. And this angel uh, uh, rebelled against God with other angels. And in a moment, the Bible says God just said to them, commit them to pits of nether gloom 
until the judgment. No mercy, no forgiveness, no hope. Just simply what God said was, I am the righteous, perfect God of all the universe. Therefore, in your face, out of my way. And that's what it was. Right from the beginning, the Muslims got a point. In your face, righteousness. And the same happened to Adam and Eve. Well, that wasn't quite as bad. This time, God did not destroy the people. He did not destroy the human race uh, as he had cast out the devils who became the demons and, and Satan himself. Uh, this time, God forbear. And then God's patience, the Bible says, waited during the days of Noah when he said, I'm going to destroy all the nations of the earth. I'm going to wipe out every living thing on the earth. In your face, righteousness. The whole earth is rebelling against me. But still, God's patience waited. And as you look through the old covenant, you see more and more that the patience, the kindness, the mercy, the tolerance of God becomes more conspicuous. But at the time, one of the, probably the foremost feature of who God is, the face of God, if you want to call it that, righteousness, absolute righteousness, intolerance of evil. And that's the word that is found, the little word, it occasions the little word that defines everything that's wrong with the human race in its response and relationship to God, sin. Yes, I'm sure you all got it. S-I-N. S-I-N is what's the problem with Islamic State. Bound in sin. Bound in iniquity. Not realizing that what it's doing, what it thinks that by ethnic cleansing and religious cleansing and by killing people and murdering them, doesn't see what it's facing. They'll stand in before the Lord. As you have done, so it'll be done to you. And that's the judgment that'll face them. But for God, what he wanted with the people of Israel was a holy, separated nation with God as ruler. Once again, in Islam, you have 99 names of God. Uh, and some, most of them are Quranic, but they go like this. Uh, Ar-Rahman, the compassionate. Ar-Rahim, the merciful. Al-Malik, the sovereign. Al-Qudus, the holy. And then on to others. Al-Aziz, the great. Al-Khafur, the forgiving. But Muslims will always say that that's not really who Allah is. In fact, you cannot know who Allah is. Whatever your mind imagines him to be, that he is not. These are just his attributes. Uh, and then he's entitled to exercise those attributes, any one of them, as he wills at any given moment. But in Islam, in the Quran, Allah is basically will and power. That's it. My will is what I will exercise according to my own judgment, and I will exercise it in power. And the Islamic State seems to think that's a license to behave as it likes in his name. But in the Bible, people have, you know, asked, how would you define God in the Bible? 99 names? By the way, I've got no problem with those 99 names. They're all biblical, every single one. The compassionate, the merciful, the holy, the just, the forgiving, they're all biblical. But if I have to look at the God of heaven, I see two things about him that define him more than anything else. One is righteousness, the other is love. Those are the two. And righteousness is the character of the old covenant, but slowly, patiently you see the love of God building up and coming higher and coming more to the fore. And what I'm going to suggest to you is, and this is my impression of it, the face of God is righteousness, but the face of God is not love. Not. Love is something that dwells in the depth of his being, the very depth of his being. It's take, it took time. It took at least 2,000 years from the time of Moses to Jesus before the love of God came to full expression in Jesus and before it came up to being an alternative to righteousness as to the way God was going to handle his people. And eventually, love took over completely. But why? Why would, why would love, God's love take time to come to fruition? The reason being, it's not what we call love. It's not feeling a sort of sympathetic, affectionate feeling towards creation like we've got. No, no, no. The word used in, in Greek is agape. Agape love meaning self-sacrificial love. It was God going against himself all the time. God finding it far easier to put his righteousness into the face of other people rather than to say, no, I would rather express my love to them. 
But the Lord knew that with the universal sinfulness of the human race that had destroyed any hope of a personal relationship between God and his people, God knew that this was a permanent block. And for his love to overrule it, it had to become stronger, stronger, stronger. Now we get to the time of the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all the minor prophets. This is a time, I remember when I was in the army uh, 40 years ago, a young Jewish guy in our regiment spoke to me about this. And this is a time that even the Jews were aware that something was happening. And my friend Len in our regiment said to me, one night we were just on maneuvers, and he kept me up for four nights, four hours that night. And he said to me, he said, you know, he said, I've asked our rabbis and others why it is that the Jewish scripture starts with God, moves on to the law and Moses, moves on to the establishment of the nation, but by the time of the prophets, it starts picking up momentum. Something new is coming. Something special is coming. A Messiah is coming. A redemption is coming. A deliverance is coming. He said, and then, 2,500 years ago, it stopped. And we've never heard from God since. <laughs> I thought that was very perceptive. And I, well, you know what I told him. I said, you have heard from God since. The problem is your nation missed him. But you got what you didn't expect. And that was the whole thing. The Jewish people didn't read and understand those prophecies. Those prophecies are not just prophecies of something new to come. They are expressing the heart of God, which by now was taking over God's attitude to the human race. The heart of God rather than in your face righteousness. And what was happening was simply this that God had got to a point where his anger against the nation of Israel for disobeying him and living in disobedience to him had become white hot. And if I read some of these words to you, just listen to this. When This is from Hosea, one of those prophets. When they had fed to the full, they were filled, and their heart was lifted up. Therefore they forgot me, so I will be to them like a lion, like a leopard, I will lurk beside the way. I will destroy you, O Israel. Who can help you? What does that tell you? Just how angry, just the white hot anger of God against his people for just ruining the relationship between him and them. Amos, another prophet. I know how many are your transgressions, how great are your sins. I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. We move on, another one. Hosea again. Because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. And then finally, Micah, God said, Oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. You can see the heart of God being expressed here. This is not the legal judge of the world putting his righteousness in their faces. This is a God who, deep within his heart and soul, is burning with anger against his people for their constant rejection of him. But then, you find these words. Joel, another one of the prophets of the time. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts, and not your garments. And then again, I will heal their faithfulness. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. With God, it had got to a point where, on the one hand, his burning anger, because the people were confronting his righteousness all the time with their own sinfulness and unrighteousness, had come to a white-hot pitch and a time for decision. But on the other hand, the burning love of God for the human race, for his people, expressed in all these texts, was coming out again. These are only some. I could have written about 20 out. Uh, coming out again, time and again, building up to a point where his love had reached a white-hot pitch as well. And God simply had to ask himself a question. What do I do? This is not a crisis time for God. It wasn't as though it was a contradiction. You know, what do I do? On the one hand, I want to burn them out. On the other hand, I love them. So, you know, what am I going to do? <laughs> no, it was just simply with him. What shall I choose to do? And the choice of the Lord was to opt to suspend his righteousness, his anger, his wrath. Suspend it till the day of judgment and to decide to enter into a new age with these people 
of love, compassion, kindness, opening nothing but his hand to the whole world, everyone, not just Jewish people, the whole world, and say, come and join me, come into my love. And God knew what it was going to cost him. He knew that it was going to cost him the death of his own son, the highest price. Only the white heart love of God would have been prepared to go that far and even put his hand against his own son. I will bring my servant the branch, Zechariah, another one of the prophets of the time. I will remove, God said, the guilt of this land in a single day. That Good Friday. That's when it was removed. If you look at the book, the Gospel of Matthew, and you read just the first chapter, I don't know if any of you have ever bothered to read through genealogies. Well, when I read the Old Testament and you come up against them, I tend to skim through them. Most of those names mean nothing to me. But this genealogy of Matthew's is very interesting because he lists a whole lot of names. He starts with Abraham, and then he goes down to David, and then he goes down to the deportation to Babylon, and then he comes to, to Jesus. And he says there were 14 generations to David, 14 to Babylon, 14 to Jesus. And if you look at those generations, you can see a clear distinction between them. The first 14 are the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, Judah, and so on. And each one of them were the patriarchs of the nation of Israel prior to the time of the great King David. Now David was the King of Israel and he symbolized the coming of the Messiah who was promised, the great King. So Matthew follows that line down. And the next 14 in the second generation are all kings. David was the father of Solomon. Solomon the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam the father of Abijah. Abijah the father of Asa. Asa the father of Jehoshaphat. See, I even know them both by heart. <laughs> but they were the kings of Israel until Babylon. And then at Babylon, it says when the people came back, uh, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel. And then it's a list of names you've never heard of before. Obscure names. Patriarchs, kings, no name brands, nobodies, till Jesus. And that's what the change was. And this is what the Muslim world doesn't understand. That God, having moved from the time of Moses and a theocratic state and a nation called to obey his law and to be who he is, had changed direction at the time of the prophets because the white hot depth of his love had risen to a point where it had overridden his righteousness and he was prepared to suspend his righteousness to open the door of love and compassion, forgiveness, redemption, salvation to the world. That's what the Muslim world misses. At that point, God said, we're going in a different direction. Now, that was the time when God brought in the new covenant. To me, the pivotal text that defines the old covenant relationship of God to his people was the one I mentioned. I am who I am. Be careful. <laughs> Be who I am. Be holy as I am holy. But the pivotal Old Testament text, the pivotal text that defines the moment when God changes direction is Jeremiah 31 verse 3. Jeremiah is my favorite book in the Bible. It's the book where God just pours out his heart. And in this one he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. You know what he was saying to the nation? My love has reached a white hot pitch. Everlasting love. Therefore, I'm not going to judge. I'm continuing my faithfulness to you. And in the very same chapter, just a few verses onwards, come these words. Behold, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Not like the one I made with their fathers because they broke that covenant. They spoilt it. So I paid no heed to them. But he says, but this is the covenant I'll make with my people. I will put my law in their hearts and I'll write it on their minds. I will be their God. They will be my people. None of them will say to each other, know the Lord. They will all know me personally from the depths of their being because I'll be merciful towards their iniquities. I will remember their sins no more. If you can find 
anything remotely like that in the Old Testament, anywhere before that passage in Jeremiah, please show it to me. <laughs> the angels of heaven must have said, but you know these people, you can't just change your attitude towards them, it's not going to be that easy. And God would have said, I know. It's going to cost me the highest price I've got to pay to achieve this. I'm going to have to get just one man who does reflect my righteousness. One man who does show back to me the absolute perfection of what I wanted in a human being. But that cannot be any human being. I won't find one, and even if I could, one man can't die for another. But my own son, the very image of my being, who can in a day work the redemption of a people that I can draw out for myself and call out for my name, I'm going to have to put my hand against him. And you and I will never, not even in eternity, ever know what the price was that God paid to redeem us. But take these words from Ezekiel. This is also a promise of the new covenant. I'll sprinkle clean water upon you. You'll be clean from all your uncleannesses. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I'll put within you. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. What is God saying? He's saying, with the old covenant, I said to you, you shall do this and you shall not do that. And I have held you responsible for that to this very day. But in this new covenant, I'm going to hold myself responsible to make sure this covenant works. I love that. That's my confidence. That's my assurance as a Christian. God says to me, don't worry, John, you might feel you could fall away from me but I'm not going to let you go even if I said to the Lord look you know I've been a Christian 43 years that I have now and um, you know I've had enough of this I, I think I'm going to move away your Holy Spirit's free to leave me I'll die and take my chances you know what will happen he won't go <laughs> he won't go he's got me he and I like he, with every child of God born of God's spirit he and I are absolutely united to each other booked for glory booked for heavenly destiny, no matter what. And that's the glory of this new covenant. Beauty of it is, is God saying, I will, I will, I will. All these passages, I will sprinkle clean water. I will put a new spirit within you. I will put my law in your hearts. I will forgive your sins. Holding himself responsible to make this new covenant work. God wants a personal relationship with human beings on earth. And for those who come into it and who just respond to that grace, that open hand of grace that the Muslim world just can neither know nor understand, that is the way to eternal life. A gift, just take it with both hands and it's yours. Like somebody just holding out a gift to you, beautiful gift. And you say, what, do I, what must I pay you for this? I'd love to have it, but I mean, I must pay you for it. So no, it's a gift. Please just take it, but take it with both hands. Commit yourself to me entirely and I'll give you everything in return. That's the... Christian way, of, way that God has given us in the new covenant. God changed direction. And that's what the Muslim world can't see. The time of Jeremiah, time of Ezekiel, we're going in a different direction. It's no longer what God says to you and me is not be holy as I am holy or pass up. You know, <laughs> you find out what the consequences are. No, no. The new word of God to us is an appeal. Become who I want you to be. That's all. Become who I want you to be. It's as simple as that. When you look at Islamic State, top dog, caliphate over the rule of the Muslim people and Muslims, top dogs, enforcing their rule over one another, fighting one another, trying to conquer one another, trying to get on top of one another, a whole lot of them thinking each one they know the best way to create this purest, idealist Islamic State. In the New Covenant, there are no top dogs, not even Jesus himself. Reason being that in the Old Covenant, I've often noticed that there are quite a lot of, of, of figureheads, usually two who were top dogs. For example, Aaron and Samuel, the two famous priests and, and very, very much, uh, not in control, but, but in, in certainly a position of tremendous prominence over the nation of Israel at their times. Aaron and Samuel, two kings, David and Solomon, ruling the nation at the best time of Israel's history prior to the downslide and eventually the new covenant. And then again, Moses and Joshua, the 
two deliverers who brought Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. Top dogs. And then in the New Testament, Annas and Caiaphas, the two high priests. But when you look at John and Jesus, John the Baptist and Jesus, Luke puts this so beautifully in Luke 3. He says, when in the year the, the reign of Tiberius Caesar, top dog number one, ruling the whole Roman world and the nation of Israel, Tiberius Caesar, top dog. In that rule, when Pontius Pilate was governor of this region, Judea, top dog. And when Herod was tetrarch of Galilee and Philip tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, Luke goes on, he rubs it in. In the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, top dogs. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the desert. <laughs> Nobody. No name brand. Just like Jesus. John executed, beheaded by the age of 33. Jesus crucified and dead. Both of them dead and buried. Helpless. Not one of them put up a fight or tried to resist being knocked out. They weren't top dogs. You know, it always amazes me about Jesus. And I've looked through the, the Gospels and I've always been amazed at this. He never once talked to his disciples about leadership. Never. He never showed them how to become leaders of his church who was to follow. He never had leadership courses. Never had training courses. He didn't send them to Rabbi Gamaliel's school of theology to know how to lead other people. Jesus was only interested in one thing with his disciples. Discipleship. Following. Not leading. Following. So that every child of God in the new covenant is a follower, a disciple of Jesus who came down to the bottom, to the gutter and did not assert his authority over anyone in his time. Never used his power like Islamic states trying to do to establish the kingdom of God on earth. No, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. There were two other bottom dogs in the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha. And they came at the very time where God said, we're changing direction. Elijah missed the boat a bit, but I don't blame him. I think we all would. I don't think Elijah fully appreciated quite what this meant when God made it clear, we're changing direction. But Elijah and Elisha were the two bottom dogs. They were the persecuted prophets. They were nobodies. Elijah went about like John the Baptist in skins of sheep and goats, eating lizards for, you know, for, for, for lunch if they could find one somewhere. Uh, that was their, their way of life. They were nobodies in their time. But when Elijah, after three and a half years of being a nobody, came up and faced um, Ahab, I think he almost felt like Moses standing in front of Pharaoh, see the hand of the Lord. <laughs> Today, your days are numbered. Yeah. And that's what Moses did. When they got to the Red Sea, and Moses just stretched out his staff over the sea and it opened and the Israelites went through safely. The whole army of, his, of the Egyptians was destroyed. Goodbye, Pharaoh. Down you go. <laughs> and I think that's what Elijah expected. Goodbye, Ahab. You're next. You know? <laughs> when 450 prophets of Baal were killed in a single day, that's what uh, Elijah thought. This is my moment. This is where I... And Moses has got something in common. And Elijah wakes up the next morning and the rain has stopped and it's a beautiful sunny day. And Jezebel, Ahab's wife, sends a message to him. As you did to those prophets yesterday, so will I certainly do to you. And Ahab, Elijah suddenly realizes nothing's changed. God hasn't judged. He's cleansed, but he hasn't judged. He hasn't judged Ahab. He hasn't judged Jezebel. And Elijah says, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> he runs down to Sinai wilderness where God says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> God had changed direction. That is why Moses had authority over Pharaoh, but Elijah had none over Ahab. That's the Christian faith. We are called to be servants of God, servants of the world, servants in love, lay down our lives and give everything to God of what we have. The reason is because the sin problem has been solved. And as far as God is concerned, the price he paid for that, to bring that new covenant in, and to resolve this, that we can be delivered from sin in eternity, and we can be go, uh, partakers of his kingdom and his glory. Therefore, God says, I expect my followers not to be who I am, but to be prepared to be down in the ground, 
in the service of all other people on earth and to be inconspicuous, not like Islamic State, not like any of the powers of this world, but a people called out for his name and working on the one thing God really wants. And this is what ISIS and Muslims miss completely. Compassion, kindness, self-sacrifice, willing to die if necessary that others may live. Um, love above all. Humility. Because we have the example of all that in our figurehead. Our figurehead wasn't a ruler like Moses or Muhammad. He was a servant. Came into the world not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Let me close with these words of the Apostle Paul, which are what the Christian faith calls us to be, as opposed to what Muslims think Allah wants them to do. I do not count my life of any value, says Paul in Acts 20, 24. If only I may accomplish my course and fulfill the ministry which the Lord gave me, the Lord Jesus gave me to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I'm prepared to sacrifice my life for that. And then secondly, Philippians 3 verse 7 following, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, he says, I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. For his sake, he said, I've suffered the loss of all things. I count them as refuse if I may only gain Christ and be found in him if I may take part in his resurrection, and so on. That's the heart of what the Christian faith is. That's what Muslims can't understand. Humility, kindness, compassion, self-sacrifice. They think it's a sign of weakness. It is not, especially when we show that love towards them. In all circumstances, when we respond in love towards their arrogance and abusiveness. The last thing, we call to love our enemies, and it's only when the enemies see what we're prepared to do to show them that love that they may see the love of God in Christ and see just what the change of direction has brought about. In my office, about two through now, about four years ago, I had two women, who Christian believers, who know me well. They know the ministry I'm in among Muslims. So they started talking about it, and they started talking about Israel. And they said that uh, the Muslims are terrible people and they're trying to eliminate Israel and they're trying to fight America and trying to, by the way, trying to eliminate each other as well. And she said, these are the enemies of God. <laughs> so I said, well, I said, we can't take a hostile attitude towards him in return. I said, because Jesus called us to love our enemies, no matter who they are. And then she said to me, ah, yes, she said, he might have called us to love our enemies, but he never told us to love his enemies. <laughs> I had to think so quickly, and I just said to her, Mama, I said, if God can't love his own enemies, he can't expect us to love ours. <laughs> yeah. we, our religion, our faith, is a totally different thing. It was based on a totally different foundation, not on law, not on a structure, not on a theocracy, and least of all, brutal means of trying to establish it. It's based on exactly the opposite. Individual faith, binding together in love, quietly, inconspicuously, that all of us become no-name brands in the world, unknown, unheralded, unrecognized. But we live in the service of God until Jesus comes, longing for the salvation of Muslims as much as anyone else. Rudolph, thank you. Thank you, Uncle John.